Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, folks. Welcome aboard the Max Afterburner Podcast, sponsored, powered, brought to you by No Fallen Heroes. Make sure you go on Instagram and follow us at No Fallen Heroes. Man, we have some great stuff going on, and I got my long-lost brother, uh, the prodigal son, has returned, my brother Slider. Marcus, how you doing, my friend? <laughs> I'm good with how you doing, man. It's been a minute. Uh, we've been pretty busy, though, haven't we? Yeah, no shit. So before we jump into it, man, bring us up to speed, because I know you went to D.C. and did some. Give us a quick executive summary of the VPCA, because uh, what a great organization. I know you touched on it briefly in a previous podcast about your cancer, but uh, bring us up to speed with uh, where where's Waldo been uh, since we last talked? Uh, yeah, that's a great event. You know, uh, Bing Crosby, another uh, uh, another bro. I guess he, you guys were in a squadron together way back when. Uh, I'd crossed paths with him a few times, and I saw, you know, he went through a pretty nasty case of uh, prostate cancer, like far too many uh, veterans, and particularly, you know, tactical aviators are, are going through. Yep. Uh, and I popped up on my social media a couple of years ago, so I reached out to Bing, and I told him my story, and um you know, I kind of have chimed in here and there on that stuff. But, uh, you know, they had their big annual gala up at the National Press Club uh, on Veterans Day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was very flattered uh, that they thought my story was interesting enough to ask me to do the keynote. So mm-hmm. I don't know if they know I've never done a keynote before, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to go up there and, uh, you know, I wrecked my truck on the way up. Uh, there was just some horrible, yeah. horrible weather and terrible traffic. You know how it is on DC, you know, 95 on a Friday afternoon. Oof. So, uh, it was a pretty, it was, it was a rough ride, man. So I went skidding to a stop up, you know, I hockey stopped at the event and, uh, <laughs> uh, probably wasn't super well prepared, but I just jumped up there and told my story. So, you know, that's uh, awesome. Prostate cancer two times, once, once at the age of 42, mm. um, didn't know what a prostate was Yeah. at that point. Uh, I knew it was a man part, wasn't exactly sure where it was or what it did. Uh, but you know, one day I mentioned to my flight surgeon at my annual, uh, physical that I was just having this really urgent need of the onset to urinate. Uh-huh. Um, and it was happening for probably a couple months at that point. And I just mentioned it to him. And, uh, you know, I'll fast forward through the story, but it turned out I had a pretty raging case of prostate cancer at the, at the age of 42, Jeez. which, you yep. know, this is why Bing started the Veterans Prostate Cancer Awareness yep. uh, Project. So, um, you know, I had I, the surgery and all that. And it came back about six years later, it came back a second time and I had to go yep. through radiation and all that. So, you know, you know, I was really grateful to, to be able to tell that story. And, you know, since we're talking about it right now, Man, if you're if you're 40, get your number get checked. checked. Get yeah. your PSA checked. Get it checked every year, man. It's just yeah, it's so easy to detect it early. And if you detect it early, it's very treatable. You know, guys shouldn't be dying about this uh, over this this issue. And yeah, you know, for veterans, it's it's what like three times as prevalent. Yeah, well, and not not only is it three times as prevalent, uh, but you know, talking to Bing, he says that the suicide rate for veterans diagnosed with cancer is. 40% higher than quote average. Uh, so vets who are diagnosed with cancer or prostate cancer, man, their suicide rates go through uh, the roof. So actually uh, Bing and, and kids ears are probably burning. Cause I talked to him yesterday. We're going to 2023, we're going to do some good work. We're going to fly formation uh, with the VPCA because Bing uh, and kid are doing some great work to, to put up the bat signal to get checked and all the treatment stuff and they're focusing some great work on the body, but slider fighter and whiz fighter, we're going to help focus on the mind too. Uh, if you watch how to change your mind on Netflix with Michael Pollan or read the book, you know, the Johns Hopkins, not some Smith college or the Guatemala medical school did a psilocybin study with cancer patients. And what was it, bro? Like 80, 85% said, Hey man, I feel great. No fear of end of life. I can enjoy my life. And I mean, if it was 5% or 10, I'd be like, okay, well, yay for those couple, but 85%, man. So we're going to do some good work with the VPCA uh, coming up next year. Now, before we dive into what we're here to talk about, I'm going to ask your engineer brain, 
Do you think like no? What would what you guys had the fucking Aug nine or whatever it was called? We had the APG sixty five and seventy three. What do you, is it because we're sitting behind a couple feet behind this massive transmitter? What do you think that cause is using your engineer brain? Why why is cancer higher for aviators like us? You know that's a really important question, with and you know getting to the to the answer is part of the mission of of. Uh, uh, VPCA. True. Yep. Um, yeah, the AUG-9 is, you know, the most powerful intercept radar ever uh, put it, installed in any fighter in the history of fighter aviation. You know, 10,000 watts. Wait, hold on. Right. Now, is, is Sledge going to have a problem with this? It's more than the than the Eagle? <laughs> uh, it ab- absolutely is. Now, <laughs> part of that is, you know, our, our new radars, you look at, at the Super Hornets we're flying around now, That you know, the Acer radars, they have, you know, we can't talk about yeah. the level, but much much lower output and that's because we have low noise True. receivers and you just don't have to balance as much energy off you know the aug 9 was was designed in the 60s yeah uh a little bit of a, a brute force instrument you know it just <laughs> blasts power out there the other thing is we had to support the phoenix missile and you know i've seen yeah uh southern iraq we had it we had a mig 25 launch uh out of talil was coming at us at mach three at 50,000 feet. You know, I've seen a 120 mile shot with, with the Phoenix missile. So the wow. only way you can support a missile at that range is, is with a lot of, lot Energy. of power. So, yep. um, you know, so that's right down there by your feet. Uh, and you fly around with that thing on pretty much all the time, you know, but I, yeah. and I talked about this, uh, at the gala, you know, the first day I got on a ship, I, you know, I took a shower and I was like, man, this smells like jet fuel. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Like that. I got my hair smelled like jet fuel. You know, yeah. that's a that's a navy thing. Yeah. Um, you know, I remember spent a lot of time up up uh on Vulture's Row watching, you know, the, the yeah. dance on the flight deck and all that. You got giant surveillance yeah, radars does. and all kinds uh, of comms gear spinning around right behind your head. I mean, we're just getting blasted with our app. Yeah. The other part is you know, you're up at 30, 40, 50,000 feet with nothing but a, you know, a piece of plexiglass yeah. between you and the cosmos radiation. That, that might be something too. Yeah. We got, we got to figure this out. Well, dude, I, you know, remember you and I'd be sitting on the flight deck, you know, waiting for launch and on, through your headsets, every couple seconds you hear what? Wee. <laughs> you just hear a little, like a little, oh, yeah. like, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> what, you know, just every couple seconds, it's either the, that radar, t- you just, you, you hear it in your headset, like, what the, wheat? I'm like, all right, this can't be healthy, but hey, real quick. Remember, you used to, you used to have to wrap your, uh, if you go up there with a foil. you had to wrap it in tinfoil, it didn't <laughs> exactly. work. Exactly. Yeah, if you took your, <laughs> I mean, there, you Slider know? and I are dating ourselves, but like your handy cam up on the flight deck, man, it would, yeah, you'd have to wrap it in tinfoil, so it didn't, it, it could work. So anyway, they didn't wrap us in tin. Well, the Prowler guys, didn't the Prowler guys have like the gold canopy or something like that? It was pretty cool. Allegedly, that protected them from uh, all the trons they were putting out. But before I forget, where can folks, I should have wrote this down, bad pre-flight, where can they watch that full video? You posted it on YouTube or something, right? From the B- BPCA? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you know, worst case they scenario, I'll post it anywhere. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, get me the link. I'll post this, guys, in the description of this podcast. I'll put the link to Slider's uh, video in there. And worst case scenario, follow Slider. It, it's at Slider Fighter uh, on Instagram, and, and Slider can uh, kind of give it to you as well. Um, all right, my brother, now let's get into it. Let's get airborne. Let's launch. Uh, what do you want to, do you have anything, you know, just like in Congress, I want to revise and extend my remarks. Do you have anything to uh, clean up from before? Anything you want to add? Because uh, I don't want to tell you this publicly, but looking at the metrics of the of your podcast, they're just through the roof. So you're reaching a lot of people. Do you have anything to clean up uh, from anything we talked about in the past? Um. You know, God, God makes uh, us perfectly imperfect. So yeah, I'm sure there's some things in there that maybe could have been said a better way, but you know, as we, we no, anything to add a conversation, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, yeah. I want to be careful about suggesting that you can go and have one of these medicine experiences and you, you come back all better. That is, Definitely not it. And I, th- I think this will lead into our conversation is, um, 
you know, this stuff kicks the door open. It spills your guts out in front of you. It makes you see it in, in blinding white light. The truth is, is, uh, undeniable. Mm-hmm. Um, and that opens the door to healing, to changing yep. your life, your habits, uh, not just in the, in your daily routine, but the, in the way you look at things, the way you think, the stories you tell yourself. And that is a lifelong yeah. process journey. Um, you know, the, yeah, it absolutely is. And, and, you know, the Ibogaine and, and the five as well, either one by themselves, uh, is a nuclear breaching charge. <laughs> so, I mean, you just blow the yeah. wall out and then you got to look at yourself. Yeah. Some of that's a little scary. Um, mm-hmm. and, and some of it's hard to hang on to, you know, what are we were about a year since we went down and, and shot the, uh, yeah, January. You know, Fallen Heroes documentary, right? So, mm-hmm. so it's it's been a year, and you know, as time goes on, I'm finding uh, you got to you got to fight a little more. It's easy right at the start, and that's yeah. the, the best window of opportunity. But as time goes on, you got to you got to really commit yourself to not falling back into old Correct. habits, old ways of thinking. Yep. You know, it, it's definitely, it's work you got to do forever. So that that's a perfect segue, my brother. You got to put in the work, right? The, the ratio that I, I lived through that Martine, Doc Martine and Cynthia did a pretty good job with, you know, throttle back with, you know, because I'm like, I'm healed. They're like, yeah, dude, 95% of it is in the post flight. I'm like, I'm different they were right. I was wrong. So let's get into the, uh, let's get into the integration, man. Cause you had two integrations, uh, technically you and I both did right from shooting all over the room, <laughs> with love and light with your first five experience to you and I having some similar trans subsonic, uh, issues. So talk us through, why don't we break up your integration into goods and others? Cause there ain't no bad. There's never any bad, right? Like slider just said, uh, you know, there can be some scary things on the medicine, but as I learned in my medicine work is when I put, to use your term, when you put that nuclear breaching charge on anything that's bad, when you shine light on it and you're forced to actually confront it, at least in my experience, it turned out to not be that bad uh, and to to accept it and to find some peace, man. All that darkness, when you put a fu- the fucking shining light of, again, choose your word, God, source, truth, divine, when it, 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 it can't survive in my personal opinion. So there ain't no bads. So talk us through the goods after each medicine, what were the goods? And then we'll get to the others. Yeah, it's the truth was, and I, you know, uh, at least for, you know, my two, I began, what did we talk about those in, uh, I think episode 39, episode 40 of this podcast, we talk about my two, I began experiences and they yeah. were very different. You know, my first one, was a lot of light, a lot of truth. Uh, and I'll share a little bit of that with you here in a second, just more specifically instead of generally. Um, you know, my second journey was pretty dark. Yeah. And I, you know, felt like I was on the battlefield of good and evil and I was, you know, in, in the fight. That, that was tough. Interestingly, you know, some other medicines, if you talk to guys who've been to these ayahuasca ceremonies, those tend to, there's tends to be a lot more shadow work in those things, a lot of yeah. darkness that you've face and um i'm a little scared of some of the darkness man what we'll, we'll get to that but yeah um you know since we're talking about integration let me give you uh, you know i think when we talked about my first ibogaine journey i talked about the truth of all things was revealed to me in a flash right yeah. so specifically here's a big one man and this is one of my intentions when i when i went down there is uh you know i've got two sons uh, Max is, is 20 years old now. Jackson's uh, 18. Mm-hmm. Uh, just the joy of my life. I mean, they're just amazing young men. They have, they have great intellects, uh, uh, big hearts, uh, great athletes. I mean, they're just kicking life's ass. It's, it's, it's genetic, my Maybe brother. Better. It's genetic. Keep up the good work. <laughs> well, this father, like all others, hopes for nothing more than his sons to be better than he is. Correct. So. <laughs> yes. Very well said. Uh, you know, we're trying, we're trying to do that. Um, you know, it's interesting. They, 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 these two, two young men come from the same genetic material, but they're very different, different yeah. persons. Sure. You know, Max is, Max is a very, I, I swear to God, he's an old soul. He was 25 when he was 10 years old. You know, <laughs> he's a 
a deep thinker. He's kind of an introvert. Um, you know, I remember sending him to time out and, and it'd just be dead silent up there for two hours and I'd go in his room and he was in there reading Encyclopedia Britannica. Oh, you know, wow. Just, uh-huh. It's just, he was very happy to, to have. <laughs> Thanks for the time out. And he, he didn't, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was, that backfired. He, he didn't need a lot of time. Neither <laughs> of my kids did. They're good kids. But, um, it, you know, a different personality. Uh, and that's a little different than me. You know, I'm a spaz. My, my heart's on my sleeve. I'm big and loud yeah. and it, you know, I'm a Tomcat guy. I, I belong to there. No, I'll, I'll make fun of myself. No. On that, but, <laughs> you know, Jackson, uh, I see lots of, lots of myself and Max, but Jackson's different. Jackson, Jackson's me. Jackson, in a lot of ways, Jackson is much more like I was when I was a kid. My mom says it all the time. Yeah. By the way, every mother's day that when I first see my mom, I, I who's, an absolute angel. I go up to my mom and I give her a hug and I, and I whisper in her ear, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Your mom's now going to heaven. With mini me. <laughs> oh, she's absolutely going to heaven. She is already an angel. Yeah. Um, you know, dealing with mini me who, by the way, is six, five, 200 pounds. Oh my is God. A, just a, he's wow. a unit, man. He's going to, he's going to destroy the lacrosse. The field definition of the, the brick shit house. Holy shit. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He's a, he's a beast and, and he loves all that, but you know, Jackson is me and there's nothing harder than raising a kid. is just like you or a lot like he's not exactly, <laughs> but he's a, he's a lot like me. And, and because of that, I've had a lot of fear. I, you know, I've had a tough story. Everybody has a tough story. Um, um but, you know, I don't want him to have to haul that road that I've hauled. I mean, there's been some pretty tough stuff in there. And so, yeah. you know, in an effort to be a good dad, uh, I was pretty hard on him, man. I mean, he's always test- exploring the envelope just like I did. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's a curious kid. He's a bright kid. He he's just has a big heart, man. He's a teddy bear. Mm-hmm. Um but he's always tested his boundaries. And, you know, I kind of did what my dad did was, is I was always, I needed to smack him back in the line. And I, you know, I was, I was kind of hard on him and I got frustrated as he got into his later teen years. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, it was just hard. It was frustrating. He wouldn't comply. I was giving him great advice and he wouldn't take it. Um, and that was frustrating, you know, and it, it, over time, I really felt like there was distance developing between uh, me and my son Jackson and uh, man that was heartbreaking that that was a real frustration for me and you know I was you know you guys know the story a lot of anxiety I was dealing with and and stress and it's just there's just a lot going on so how old how old was how old was Jackson like when you left the nav and stuff was was that the teenage years or what's the like map that out navy versus kids and and your experiences uh, he was he was eight years old when I retired from the Navy. Okay, uh, is that right? Yeah, in twenty twelve. So That's he's right. so his he's teenage 20. years were some of the, as you alluded to, the dark or or some some tough hoeing you were doing at that time. Yeah, I mean during the years that preceded that, I was deployment, 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 exactly. deployment. Uh, you know, so I was coming and going all the time. And then when I got out, I mean, I, yeah, you know. I was struggling for, uh, you know, almost a decade. I mean, I had some pretty rough years and, and those were very formative years for him. Correct. Um, and it, t- and it took a toll, you know, Max is very stoic. Like I said, he's, he's just ahead of his age uh, <laughs> in maturity yeah. and he, he got it. He understood. Like he, he, he's an old he soul. He never blamed me for any of that. Yeah. Yeah, man. He just got it. I mean, what a, what an example he is. Um, you know, and nothing against Jackson, but Jackson was younger and, yeah. you know, all he got, he was getting the wrong message from me. Mm-hmm. And this gets us to, you know, I went down to the medicine and one of the big things that was weighing me down when I went down there was I didn't like where my relationship with Jackson was. It was just breaking my heart because yeah. I'm a little choked up there. Yeah. I, you know, I, he's my son and it was just terrible. Yeah, so that's your boy. One of my big intentions was, yeah, one of my big intentions was to understand what I could do to to c- connect with Jackson on a, on a deeper level. 
you know, some of my intentions I wrote down were absolutely trivial, frivolous, stupid. I laughed <laughs> about them after the medicine because I was like, I'm asking the wrong question. Yeah. This one was not. This this was an important question. And so, you know, what's interesting about this stuff is while I was on the Ibogaine, I didn't this this answer to this question with Jackson wasn't revealed to me in bright light like some other things were. Mm-hmm. It was the gray day, right? The day after. Hold on. The for, for Nicole and Doc Martin and Cynthia, it's the discovery day. Now, if you just got out of the cockpit, it's the gray day. <laughs> so the so for all the professionals Correct. listening, that's the <laughs> discovery day. For Slider and I, it's a fucking gray day, man. But it's good. It's You laugh, you cry, you sleep, you nap, you try and eat a little bit, you cry some more, you sleep some more. Uh, this is all correct with yeah, yeah you're you're spot on uh, on that and it was one of the best days of my life yes. especially that first medicine journey yes. absolutely I sat around with three bros and we told stories from dawn to dusk I love and it. it what a beautiful day we laughed we cried we took, I mean it was a great day so you know it's also the first day of integration. True. Good right. point. That day yeah. after the medicine, that is that is square one on your integration journey, and it's and that's a great day because the the doors are wide open, the the volumes all the way up, the light is bright, and just stuff starts coming. Yeah. To you. So it was on that day that I got the answer to my relationship with Jackson, and we were yucking it up. This was at uh, you know Trevor's Trevor's place. We were, mm-hmm. He's got this little pagoda area outside we were just sitting outside yucking it up and it hit me man the whole thing hit me in a flash of light i came to understand what i could do better and so let me tell you about that because it's, it's freaking awesome man mm-hmm. my dad uh what year was he born 1932 my dad was born he was the oldest of uh of four kids uh, the oldest son, he had two, uh, a brother and two younger sisters behind him. And one day, Maple Mead, New Jersey. hey uh, what exit? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So one day he's coming home from school and there's a car parked in front of his house. His dad's not home. His dad was a, uh, like the head baker at Nabisco, Ritz Cracker Division pretty cool he's got all these little recipes about eight thousand pounds of flour and you know <laughs> stuff like that cool you know good he was a hard-working guy you know those are rough times man i mean that's, yes. you know depression it was with just inning and you know all that stuff so anyway my dad comes home walking home from school and his mom is in this car with a guy who wasn't his dad oh boy they were, yeah, they were doing the hibbity dibbity. It was, you know, clear. I mean, it was obvious. He was 12, 13 years old, I think. I might have that wrong, but r- roughly that age. You know, he walked by, he saw that, and was, you know, understandably horrified by that. So mm-hmm. I'm not sure if he ran in and told his dad or if there was a confrontation with his mom. This story isn't talked about a whole lot in my family, but, you know, we all are vaguely aware of it. Sure. But what happened the next day is he came home and his mom and his sisters were gone. Ooh. No idea where they went. Um, and again, I, the details are very fuzzy on this. But what I know about it is that my dad uh, wanted to know where the hell his sisters were. Sure. Uh, you know, he was the oldest son. He was the protector. And, and he was very, very upset about this whole thing with his sisters being gone. So mm. I don't know how he did it without the Internet and all that. But after some months, he figured out where his mom and his sisters were. So Whoa. he goes to this house. Yeah, no shit. So he goes, <laughs> wait for it. He goes to this house, knocks on the door, and some guy answers the door. I assume it was the same guy from the car. Answers the door and says, hey, you know, he says, I'm, I'm, I'm Ken Keller. I'm here for my sisters. And the guy says, who? Mm. He's like, you know, I'm, I'm the brother of, you know, his, his two sisters. And, and the guy never heard of him. What? Wow. His mom comes to the door and acts like she's never seen him before. No. Oh, my God, man. This owned him right to his face in front of this Jesus fucking guy. Christ. I mean, talk about a 
devastating emotional event there that i mean just traumatic yeah so i you know there's there's a whole long story around there but how old was your father at the time how old was he again i think 12 13 young young teen maybe oh my god yeah young guy um and i think i think his sisters eventually ended up back in his father's house uh okay doesn't matter that much but you know my dad uh very much put it on his shoulders to be the protector. Mom was out of the picture here and dad, his dad was working his ass off. And, yeah. you know, my dad had some responsibility for raising his siblings. You know, that's a, mm-hmm. that's a lot for a kid that age. So, God, yeah. you know, it's, it's just some horribly, horribly traumatic stuff here. So what came to me the day after the medicine, whatever we're calling it, mm-hmm. And I came to realize why my dad was so hard on me. I was the oldest son. And Wiz, I'm not whining. I'm not whining at all. But my dad was very, very hard on me. My mom says it all the time that his expectations for me were way beyond what was appropriate for my age. Yeah. You know, I remember other kids running around the neighborhood. I was out there with, with a mattock digging up apple trees and shit. Like, I mean, it was chores, chores, chores. And I busted my ass yeah. and. You know, I got yelled at all the time and, and there was just some possibly high standards, right? Mm-hmm. That had a lot to do with, with me becoming, you know, who I am. Um, you know, I followed my dad around with a pup like a puppy. My dad was a brilliant, brilliant man. Uh, you know, he's responsible for some of the technology that, that is in the, every transistor and every computer in the world. He's got patents, all this stuff. He's a physicist, an electrical engineer, all this stuff. I mean, brilliant mm-hmm. man, but he was a hard man and he was very distant. Um, and what I realized this day was why my dad was so hard on me. My dad was hard on me because as a child, the lesson he, he learned was that you've got to be tough. You've got to be strong. You've got to be resilient. And he did what everybody does is he developed an ego that, that uh, protected him. Yeah. Right. His ego was, I am not showing my, he had to, some of it's generational too. I mean, men just didn't talk about the feelings. No. You know, so he choked it all down. He built these high and thick walls around himself and he was just most emotionally unavailable. But he also, you know, came to believe that a man, has to be strong. When when the storm comes, yeah. it's a man's duty to hold the fucking line. And he's not wrong. But, mm-hmm. you know, he tried to make me his first son. And my, my brother as well, although I broke a lot of, a lot of trail yeah. for him. But, you know, he tried to make us the kind of guy he thought that you needed to be to survive in this world. Yeah. And that was an act of love. He did that because he loves us. That's exactly. That was how he was showing his love. That's what he knew from his life experience, man. Yeah, I I, I can totally see that. Yeah, I do. That that had never occurred to me before. I loved my dad. I mean, I, you know, I knew he was hard on me. I didn't think he was an asshole or hate him or anything. Exactly. You know, there were some years after high school when I didn't have a lot of contact with my parents. And I realized now I was running from something, but it never was overtly in my mind that I, you know, I hate my dad. I hate my parents. I I just fucking ran. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I I had almost a decade there where I was very separate from them, but I I never hated my dad. But anyway, it occurs to me why this is because my dad loves me. Mm -hmm. Right. Two things came out of that. Just dude, in a flash. One was this. I'm going to use a metaphor here. And I don't think this is an original thought. I must have heard it somewhere because I'm just not this clever, but it's pretty <laughs> good, right? I, I'm an ant. Okay. Think of insects. Insects are very, uh, very focused. They are very singular of purpose. They do their job, you know, mm-hmm. in the colony. And so, you know, my job as a human being is, is to walk my path. And your path is, is to find happiness, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, think of north. I'm an ant and I'm going, my happiness is north. And my little ant legs are turning along relentlessly. And I'm a freaking Terminator, man. Uh, I'm just going, going, going north. But the entire time I was doing that, I was riding on the back of a southbound elephant. <laughs> And you know what that elephant was? Yeah. That elephant was my subconscious. 
because the messages I received from my dad when he was trying to hold me to high standards to turn me into a hard worker, responsible, disciplined guy, when he was trying to do all that, Mm -hmm. what my little boy mind heard was you're not good Good enough. enough. Yeah. Never going to be good enough. And people who know me, I've been a cocky, confident. No, no. (laughs) We're fighter guys, right? Yeah. I mean, but, but, inside i wasn't even aware of it this that's what the subconscious is right i wasn't even aware of it i was riding on this elephant which was this method that i'm never going to be good enough yeah and so much of the pain in my life so much of my my self-destructive behavior my acting out my attitude so many of those things are linked to that message that i incorrectly received correct yeah as a kid right Mm -hmm. so i'm sitting here going yeah, what messages am I giving to Jackson? Exactly. Yeah. Same message. Mm-hmm. Holy shit. It, in all my earnest efforts to make sure my son doesn't go through the pain that I have, I went through, I'm putting him in the same, el- on the back of the same elephant. Yeah. Wow. That was because I ate some powdered tree bark from a shrub in Africa. <laughs> I mean, how fucked up is that? And we were all laughing. We were all sitting around going, 54 yeah. years I've been yeah. destroying myself, and yeah. all I had to do to figure it out was to eat some damn tree bark. <laughs> There's the trailer. Was- Bro, that is... Well, first of all, Slider, congratulations, bro, because you bro- from your father to you, you broke that generational trauma because of some fucking tree bark from Africa, man. Isn't that just, that's a God moment right there, my brother. Uh, Wah. <laughs> exactly. Wah. Wah. Yeah. No kidding with, and you know, people talked about generational trauma before I, you know, I, I hear all that and yeah, you know, my meathead. No, it was a code word. Know. I didn't know what those words meant before the medicine. I'm like, that's what a ridiculous thing. It's true. You and I both, have broken some generational trauma, man. I know I have. You just laid it on everybody. You did too. So, you know, and this isn't an ego moment. Let's take a little second here to give Slider and Wiz a little pat on the back, man, because this was not fucking easy. Um, This was extremely hard to do. Uh, And again, this ain't ego. Anybody who steps into the medicine, it's a little... There's a little bit of courage that is required. I got to be honest with you, man, because it, it, it is not uh, easy. But Slider, God bless you, man. You did you you did it. You broke that generational trauma. How did that, like, did you, tell us about the, like, getting home on the plane, because I think you shared this with me personally, but what was the homecoming like after on your integration day? Like, you know what, my brother, my, my, my son Jackson, I, you know, what was the homecoming like? Did you guys talk about it? What was that like? I had with I could not get home fast enough. It's too yes. bad they don't didn't have the Concord anymore, man. <laughs> I wanted to run to my son, man, and I got home, and I went running over there, and I sat him down on the couch, and I took and this was pretty tearful, man. Yeah. My mom was in the room too. She kind of stepped away, but she heard it, and she had a great debrief afterwards. But Aww. I told my son the same story I just told you. Wow. Yeah. Um. Uh, let me back up. I started it a different way. I walked in. I said, he, he was very angry with me. I mean, he just, you know, one word answers uh, just, I mean, there was just a lot of anger. He didn't want to connect with me. And, you know, I walked into the house and I knocked on his door and, and he, he came out of his room uh-huh. and I looked at him and, you know, I think this thing about the energy you put off when you come back for the medicine is absolutely real because yep. he looked at me and he was willing to listen to what I had. Yes. And I started with this. I said, Jackson, I, I know we haven't been getting along. I said, I want you to do, will you do something for me for 60 seconds? And he said, okay, dad, what do you want? And I said, just let me give you a hug for 60 seconds, right? So I set my watch and I go in for a, for a hug and it started out like a bro hug. Good game. You know, one of those. (laughs) Um, but I put myself into it, man. I gave him a real hug. I mean, I felt him and I, I tried to 
feel his soul. Uh-huh. You know, you, that's how you think yeah. when you're right after the medicine, yeah, you're just man. all tuned in and all this stuff. Yeah. And I just went in there and I just said, I'm going to hug him for real. Like much better than I usually hug him. And he was kind of stiff at first. Mm-hmm. But as time went on and who knows how long it was, maybe 20, 30 seconds into it, he kind of started no. relaxing and was hugging me back. Wow. And that went on for a long time. <laughs> and forever. It, it and went it, on forever, my all, brother. It went on forever. It will go on forever. Correct. Truth. Absolutely. But here's the funny part is I had set my watch wrong. So this hug is going <laughs> on probably two, three minutes. And right at the same time, we're both, we both like kind yep. of stepped back uh, and went, yeah, that was more than a minute, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. That's awesome. He's a six, five, 200 pound unit, man. Oh, <laughs> you know, yeah. Like, all, right, all right. All right. I'm good. It. I'm good, man. But, you know, the, <laughs> but, but then I went and sat down and I had that talk with him and I, good. you know, uh, the same talk we just had, I had that talk with him. Yeah. I was teary. He was, yeah. he seemed dude, I just teared up, man. You got me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, man. Well, you know what? We, we had that talk and I finished up by saying, you know, Jackson, uh, everyone is put on this earth to, to learn some lessons, to evolve. I said, every one of us has a unique path and we've got to walk our path. And I said, I am very sorry that my path has been so hard on you, mm-hmm. but here's what I promise you. On your path, there is nothing you can do wrong. Mm. I said, I sure hope you don't turn into Jeffrey Dahmer. <laughs> I said, if you did, I'd still love you. Yeah, exactly. But you've got Correct. to walk your path, Jackson. And I want to help you do that. And I'm telling you right now, with it, even with all the friction we've had, I love you. Mm. I love for you is boundless. And I said, you can always count on that. I've always got you, yeah. man. Always. Yeah. And, you know, th- this was a lot for a, you know, he was 17 yeah. at the time. It was a lot yeah. for a 17 year old kid, especially when he's been pissed off at his dad for 10 Correct. years. Correct. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you what, man, here we are a year and a half later. Mm-hmm. Jackson and I are pretty good, man. That's it. I love it. But we're having meaningful conversations and it wasn't overnight. Sure. I had it's to a journey. the course, you know, we thought we've, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. You got to make a commitment. You got to put your eyes on the horizon and keep driving. But yeah, um, I am much closer to my son and I'll tell you what, in the last year, that kid has blossomed. Mm-hmm. See? Yeah. He has blossomed and he even confided, you know, I won't air his stuff here, sure. but you know, he confided some, some, pretty sensitive stuff to me recently. Mm-hmm. Um, and I loved hearing it. And That's you know, fantastic. I didn't say this to him at the time, but what I heard suggests that I was putting him on that elephant, but he's off of it now. Fuck yeah, man. <laughs> you killed that elephant. Uh, yeah. Woo. And you know what? I, this occurred to me on the gray day as I, as I was sitting there with these guys and, and we were talking about all this stuff, this whole idea of generational tra- trauma, epigenetics, all this yep. stuff, which I did not understand at all. I could have read yeah. a book about it. I would have understood it as well as the medicine showed me. Correct. This whole thing, it hit me when we're sitting there talking about this. If I break this cycle, not only have I broken this cycle for my son, but I've broken it for his children Correct. and their children and their yeah. children. And if you go a thousand years down the road, yep. I may have just made the world a completely Correct. different place and a better place. I love it, man. These little things we do are important, man. Yeah. You gotta love the people around you and do it with all your heart. It makes the world a better place. The butterfly effect, my brother, just that little, that, that, that little tiny thing is going to have a ripple for lives, for generations, my brother. I, that brings a tear to my eyes. The sins, the sins of the fathers dies with us. Uh, you know, we broke it. Something on the medicine that uh, just the love you have for your son, both of your sons, but the, on the medicine that, and again, I don't want to ascribe a, a, a sex to, to God, but, you know, I, when I was on the medicine, I, I got, because, you know, the relationship with my dad, man, I, I just, 
and being able to experience him on the medicine as well. But I got just this feeling of God, the father, right? I, I never, I never understood, you know, a nice Catholic Irish, you know, uh, altar boy. They always used the term almighty father, but it was so cool. I actually kind of saw this lineage from the almighty father to my father, to me. And it was just this cool, like healing on the medicine that, that I, I saw this structure that the love that you can have from God, source, truth, divine to you, uh, to your children. And it was just so, so special. Um, the, and it's funny you say that, man, the, just the, the, the two times I've done the medicine kind of like you, man. And even Susie, like when Susie did her psilocybin journey with some of the, you know, seal wives and stuff like that, everybody that, you know, you and I've interacted with, you want to get home immediately. It's so cool. It's like, Hey, this was awesome. I'm out. I got to get back. Right. I got to get home. I have got to share this. want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. You just, and it's, <laughs> it's funny cause it sounded like Jack's, you know, with the hug, it's pretty interesting. Cause you know, I, I sat on the, on the beach here in Boca Raton and gave Susie a six hour debrief and God love her. She'd kind of sat there some of the time with her eyes open, like, um, what? So you probably got the same thing for Jackson because people don't know how to treat you a little bit. Right. It's funny because they're not used to this, man. No, they, no. yeah. They're just kind of looking around like, okay. And we're like, I was going to say we're different people. We're not different people. We had the shit knocked off of us. Right, man. We, we took that, you know, ball peen hammer and, and just kind of knocked knocked the rust off of us. So they're getting to see kind of who we truly are, right? But it was interesting. I forgot to leave the podcast with this, but uh, I'd love to formally announce that A.J. Buckley, one of the stars of SEAL team, is joining us um, in the No Fallen Heroes Foundation. So he's going to be on our advisory board. He's going to help us save veterans' lives and first responders and their families. I bring this up because, you know, I was talking to A.J. about the medicine. And he's like, dude, I was watching, you know, watching your Instagram videos. He's like, your eyes changed color. And I'm like, I forgot about that. Like for like, I got to go look because a bunch of people told me that they, they were like completely blue for like months after the medicine. I went and looked at some of the videos. I'm like, oh my God, that's right. My eyes were physically a diff. Well, they're the hazelish bluish, but they were like weird blue. And I was like, holy shit. But the fact that AJ noticed that like a, a physical change in my appearance was, uh, it was interesting. I was like, holy shit. So rushing home, you, you, you're right. You have this different energy and, and, you know, Bart and I talked about this on the last podcast. Um, you know, for the folks at home, there might be a little trepidation, right? Like I know, you know, Susie was kind of like, she shared this with me afterwards. Like I was kind of worried, you'd see something on the medicine that, you know, you don't love me anymore type of thing. So the folks on the home front, whether it's your two boys or, you know, a, a significant other, they can be a little nervous. Did you have any, any nervousness or anybody at home that was worried besides your boys or, um, uh, did anybody when you came home were a little worried <laughs> or surprised? You know, I don't think so is, and you know, I mean, I had been, there were a lot of people who were worried about me for years. Um, <laughs> I mean, even point. people close to me, yeah. you know. Well, our brother Ponch, right? I mean, Ponch, he, he, he's the guy that put up the bat signal. Did Ponch see any, you know, when you saw Ponch for the first time when you came back, what was the, uh, what was his debrief? Well, you know, he had heard your story at that point, and so he, you know, and Ponce is a little bit of a scientist. He was really eager to collect some data and, and analyze it. You know, you were really an experiment. Cool it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm an experiment on myself too, but it, you know, I became used to that, but you know, the process of tapering off the, uh, off the benzodiazepines with, I mean, I literally was my own lab rat through all of that. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I wouldn't say people were concerned. I, you know, I sat a couple of my closer friends, uh, down, uh, you know, my brother, Charmin, who, you, who, yeah. you know, um, sure. you know, my, my brother of another mother, another, another buddy of mine who I'm really close to, you know, I sat those guys down and told them the story about exploring the universe and, <laughs> and all my revelations and all this stuff. And they sat there, you know, you said it took you about six hours to tell Susie. I, I, I think maybe I condensed mine to three hours, but I could easily see six so, hours. Yeah. I sat there and told these guys and dude, I don't think they said a word. Their exactly. mouths were hanging open the whole time. <laughs> and they're like, I, you know, I can, I imagine now that 
they never said this to me, but they had to be going, dude, it's fucking crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but these are good buddies of mine. And, and, you know, a year and a half has gone by now. And, and yeah, you know, I can't tell you how many times they slapped me on the back and gone, man, it's so good to have you back. Yeah. Wow. I mean, they saw me in my best days and my worst days and, and now yeah. back to my best days again. Well, hey, uh, so, Charmin. Yeah. Charmin, the medicine is calling you, my friend. <laughs> I see you, well, Charmin. You know, here's a good point. Charmin's a captain in the United States Navy. It's not an option for him. There you go. Good point. How fucked up is that? Yep. You know, now he's performing very well. I think Charmin's a pretty well adjusted guy, but yeah. You know, I, I've, I've talked to a couple people recently that, you know, they're bringing up, hey, I got a guy. Hey, I got a guy. Louis Skypen. Uh, I had a yeah. phone call with him. Mm -hmm. You know, we've both, we've each been on his podcast. He talked to me yesterday. He's telling me about one of his buddies. He's asking me how we can set him up. And I'll talk about, you know, yeah. that with you offline. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, the guys who need it the most are the guys who can't do it. <laughs> exactly. That's why we've got to fix this. It's insane. You know, what happens to God? I mean, look at Marcus Capone. Here's a perfect example. Marcus Capone, 13 years in the, on the teams, right? Yep. Medically retired. What if they sent him, what if the Navy put him through a medicine protocol, gave him some time to integrate? Mm -hmm. How much money would the Navy have saved? Exactly. This guy, I mean, they put millions and millions of dollars into training this guy. His experience, he can't put a price tag on. Yep. This is a highly effective person here. Yeah. And he, they had to take him out of the game because they couldn't give him what he needed. I, you know, his story is far from unique. Sure. Well, Slider, let me give you the whiz answer to this. I, I, you know, I'm going to channel my inner uh, Timothy O'Leary. Maybe... They don't do that because guys like you, me, bar turn into what? We were knuckle dragging, fucking meat eating. My only objective is to turn that thing into hair, teeth, and eyeballs. I'm a killer. Now, if you heal some of these folks, I really don't feel like doing that. Now, you come up and, you know, you're going to break into, I'll kill everything. You know, that I posted that, what is that? The man who wanted to be left alone type of thing. That's who I am right now. But maybe slider, the government doesn't want to do that to people on active duty because they'd realize that what's the point of killing each other when we are all one, right? You and I were shooting the shit offline. I have been watched, binge watched two nights in a row, folks. I don't do this, man. I haven't moved from the couch in two nights in a row because I've been watching Our Universe on Netflix. If you've never done the medicine, this is a pretty damn good close substitute. I got to tell you the visuals. I saw all of it. I think they hacked into my brain to create the visuals for Our Universe on Netflix. I saw all of that. Slider became a screaming eagle, man, and flying down a mountain. It sounds like he saw it, too. You have got to watch Our Universe on Netflix, narrated by God, earthly God, Morgan Freeman, and it is fantastic. Why am I on this tangent or rant? Because it shows, dude, we are, Slider, me, you listening to this, we are nothing but cosmic stardust. The fact that you and I are sitting here on this podcast right now is physically impossible. I think that what's the odds of being alive today is like one in four quadrillion. I don't even, it, the math doesn't make sense to me. It's almost physically impossible that you and I are alive and talking like this. So long rambling answer to your short question, why aren't they giving this to folks on active duty? It's the Richard Nixon approach, man. It's subversive. You guys, you know, we don't want you thinking freely. We don't want you questioning authority. We don't want you loving your neighbor. We need, you're not a lover, you're a killer. Or what is it, writer? <laughs> you're not a, what are you, fucking Mickey Spillane? You're not a writer, you're a killer. Um, but, uh, oh shit, let me, uh, I'm looking at the time here. Dude, we got to do, let's do a couple more sliders. I need a good slider integration, which, D dude, reconnecting with Jackson like that, I think is the good integration, but I know you got a lot of good integration, but we also need to talk about some of the others as well with your integration. So I think we're going to have to, I'm giving you a couple of reflies, man. What do you think? 
Yeah, uh, a- absolutely uh, correct in what you said there. And, you know, you just launched about 15 separate conversations. With your, your <laughs> exactly. Like one, one minute thing there. Yeah. You know, this whole, um, yeah, we're almost out of time. Let me just rattle these off. So you talked about they're afraid we won't fight. That absolutely occurred to me. And, you know, there was that on that same grade day, uh, you know, I thought maybe they're taking all these guys who know how to fight and they're trying to trying to subdue us with the medicine. As a paranoid <laughs> that, that's not that's not what's going on. And, Correct. you know, I love me some Doug. I love me. I some love Doug. My, you know, Doug. My across the street. Yes. This is crazy. I came back. I came back from the medicine. I talked to my neighbor across the street. who's a super tuned in guy. He'd been across the street from me for over a decade. Never really had a meaningful conversation. I come back from the medicine. We start talking about stuff. Turns out he completely gets it. He gifts me a copy of the Bhagavad Gita. Mm. You're talking about this, you know, if you're tuned in, if, if you understand the connectedness of all things that you're not going to fight. Well, that's, if you haven't read the Bhagavad Gita, you got to read it. Correct. Because that's Arturo's quandary in there. You know, he's a, he's a warrior. He's the greatest archer who ever lived. And he's got to go to war against, you know, his cousins and uncle and all this stuff. And he doesn't want to fight. You know, I won't, I won't ruin the story for you, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a story that's, that's worth reading. I mean, and I've thought about this too. Um, I have guns. You know, if I have to use those to protect my family, Damn right. Uh, or my property or, or my country, you know, I've, we've all taken those. Yep. Um, don't think I'm not, I'm afraid to use those things. I will do it with a heavy heart. Like I wouldn't have before. Correct. So, uh, you know, I, I would argue, especially if you understand the message in the Bhagavad Gita that, you know, you, you are not defanged. Oh, if yeah. anything, it, it has a lot more meaning for you. Correct. That's exactly right. Um, I love that, man. That very well said. Um, so let, let's, uh, we're going to segue and, and save that for the, for the next one, man. This was awesome. God bless you and Max and Jackson. Love your family, man. You are a great human being, Slider, great American, and a great father. Um, God is right on time. All that healing happened precisely when it was supposed to, and I, I can't wait uh, watching from a distance here to watch those two fine young men uh, grow into uh, just incredible human beings like their father and their father uh, before them. So, all right, folks, we're going to have we're gonna have my brother Slider back. We're going to get Slider's own podcast, man, the Slider Fighter podcast or something, dude. We got to get you uh, your, own, your own podcast, dude, because you have such an incredible story to tell, and you're, uh, you're, you're a lifesaver, man. Uh, just anybody listening to this that is uh, impacted by a little bit, you, you've helped them out, my brother. So thanks for putting in the work. I, uh, I really appreciate it. All right, guys. Um, that's it. We're gonna we'll have some more slider uh, next week or whenever his schedule. Where's Waldo uh, gets pinned down because the dude's uh, doing the putting in the work. Like I said, so everybody have a great rest of your day. Happy hunting. Make sure you hedge fights on and namaste.